Now, here at Northcote Baptist Church, we believe the Bible, and we read the Bible, and we follow it bit by bit, section by section, and sometimes we come to uncomfortable or challenging topics. And today's message will cover topics of domestic violence and abuse. And if this raises uncomfortable issues or concerns with you, then please reach out for support and help with a trusted source or call 1-800-RESPECT. Because today as we continue our journey through the book of Ephesians and what it means to live lives worthy of the calling we've received, we come to the topic of marriage. Now we had a massive, heated and controversial national debate about the definition of marriage back in 2017 with the postal survey over same-sex marriage. But today, whilst we touch on what marriage is, I want to touch on a slightly different question. What is marriage for? What is the purpose or the meaning of marriage? In 2017, it was a lot about love. Love is love. Marriage was for the expression of love. But unfortunately, for whilst many marriages might start with love, well, there are many, 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 many jokes about marriage, which perhaps challenge the idea that marriage is, the purpose of marriage is love. Now, I found uh, a website which has a bunch of these jokes on it. I don't think this is necessarily funny, but anyway, um, I'll share some of them. For example, there's jokes like, marriage is like a bar of soap. It smells delicious until you take a bite out of it. Or well, the top three situations that require witnesses, one, crimes, two, accidents, three, marriages, need I say more? Love is blind and marriage is, in, is an institution, so why go to a blind institution? But the jokes about marriage often revolve around how women use their tongues to dominate, criticise and control, whilst men are lazy and selfish. So, for example, grooms, once you get married, remember that the, you have a discussion with your future wife, always get the last two words in, Yes, dear. Why are husbands like lawnmowers? They're hard to get started, emit foul odours and don't do work half the time. Man is incomplete until he's married, then he's really finished. Or I asked my wife if she ever fantasises about me and she said, yes, she fantasises about me taking out the rubbish, mowing the lawn and doing the dishes. Now these are jokes. I don't think they're particularly funny, but they paint an overall picture that marriage is for unhappiness, and disappointment. Maybe it was once for love, like a bar of soap, but not so nice once you're in it. An institution of derision, cynicism, and pain. So what is marriage for? Well, some have thought that marriage is predominantly an institution set up for the benefit of men. Marriage is a structure set up for the service and satisfaction of men. Take, for example, an article which was published in Housekeeping Monthly in May of 1955 entitled The Good Wife's Guide, detailing all the ways in which a wife should act and how best that she can be a partner to her husband and a mother to her children. Now, it's full of lots of advice about how to be a good wife. And generally, it seems that she is to be the servant of her husband's desires and wishes. For example, number 10... You may have a dozen important things to tell him, but the moment of his arrival, but when he comes home, is not the time. Let him talk first. Remember, his topics of a conversation are much more important than yours. Or number 11, make the evening his. Never complain if he comes home late or goes out to dinner or other places of entertainment without you. Instead, try to understand his world of very real, um, of, of very real strain and pressure and his very real need to be at home and relax. Or number 15, make him comfortable. Have him lean back in a comfortable chair or have him lie down in the bedroom. Have a cool or warm drink ready for him. Or number 17, and there's, there's, there's lots of these. Don't ask him questions about his actions or question his judgment or integrity. Remember, he is the master of the house and as such will always exercise his will with fairness and truthfulness. You have no right to question him. Your goal, to make sure your home is a place of peace, order and tranquility where your husband can renew himself in body and spirit. The wife's goal is unquestionably submit, serve and satisfy the husband. It seems that this purpose of marriage, this type of marriage, is the service and satisfaction of the husband. 
Hence, I don't think it's that surprising that in more recent times, more modern feminists, like author Clementine Ford in her recent book, um, I Don't, The Case Against Marriage, makes a passionate case against marriage for the modern woman. She wants the book to, in, to her encouragement is to, he wants the book to end marriages and prevent marriages because of the harm she believes they bring to women. She sees marriage as a corrupt tool for the patriarchy built on the oppression of women. Her objection to marriage is that it's largely great for men, while women were left with the large burden inside of the relationship. And she said, one of the chief complaints a lot of women have about their husbands is that they don't really feel like their husbands see them. All they are is a kind of like a glorified all-in-one appliance for them. And so to Clementine Ford, the purpose of marriage is primarily for the service of men, and hence the exploitation and oppression of women. So, what is marriage for? What is the meaning of marriage? Well, this is what the Apostle Paul outlines today as he outlines yet more implications of the grace of God in Christ Jesus and what it means to walk, to live in a manner worthy of the Lord. And this means living life differently to the world around us. It means walking, putting to death the deeds of the old self, greed, immorality, selfishness, and instead living, walking according to the Spirit of God, walking like a Christian. And I'm not sure if that means that you start humming that song in your head again, but anyway, but walking like a Christian, that's effectively what it means. Hence, Paul focuses his attention here in this section on the home and on what would have been the three main domestic relationships of the time. The relationships between husbands and wives, children and fathers, and slaves and masters. Now, due to the sensitivity of the topic and the size of some of these topics um, and the challenges that this raises, we're going to look at the household code over two, two separate weeks. This week, we're going to focus on marriage and next week, children, parents and slaves and masters. And so today is marriage, the purpose and meaning of marriage. A topic that is of great and very much, a great of, sorry, is very much one of great public interest as the 2017 marriage survey demonstrated. And even if you're not married, which is a number of us here, this is still a very relevant topic. For as the postal survey demonstrated, well, sorry, everyone's opinion on marriage matters. But we'll see that God's purposes and designs for marriage are far greater and more profound than love is love. And ultimately, it actually involves every one of us. But as we dive in and encounter this passage today, we, we confront some of the most culturally unpopular and challenging parts of the Bible. For there was a poll conducted a few years ago asking what people thought was the worst Bible verses. They got a survey and they collated what they claimed to be the 10 worst Bible verses, which they believed approved sexism, genocide and slavery. And coming in at number nine in the list of the top ten worst Bible verses was Ephesians chapter five, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Apparently one of the worst verses in the whole Bible. It's one of the worst because this verse has been used to justify sexism, domestic violence, and the abuse and control of women. A few years back, journalist Julia Baird wrote a very powerful piece, an uh, online piece called Submit to Your Husbands, Women Told to Endure Domestic Violence in the Name of God. And in her article, she tells the story of a woman, Sally. The night before Sally finally left her husband, she told, she was, she, he told her that she was failing her spiritual duties. And he yelled at her. He yelled at her, your problem is you won't obey me. The Bible says you must obey me and yet you refuse. You're a failure as a wife, as a Christian, as a mother. You are an insubordinate piece of... A word there which I can't repeat. Sally, an executive assistant who had just turned 44, stared at him, worrying about whether her neighbours or her sleeping daughter could hear his roars through the thin walls. She knew what he'd flicked his switch. 
the simple act of coming down to say goodnight, which he interpreted as a lack of willingness to have sex. Her husband, Peter, then opened the, his Bible and read out some verses. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he's himself its saviour. Ephesians 5, 22 to 23. So this is it, is it? Ephesians 5, 22, one of the worst verses in the Bible from which a husband can demand what he likes from his wife. Is this a verse which justifies domestic violence? Maybe as the good wife guide seems to kind of applaud. Just as Clementine Ford warns that marriage is a patriarchal institution designed to grind submission from wives for the comfort and service of their husbands. Well, this passage, the whole passage that we're reading today was actually read at Di and my wedding. Yep, it was actually Di's suggestion to have this Bible passage read at our wedding. Why? Well, because it actually outlines God's vision for marriage, God's purpose for marriage, the meaning of marriage. And it speaks of a grander vision of marriage than the good wife guide. And it does speak about different roles for men and women. And yes, much to the consternation of our modern secular culture, it does speak about submission. Now, some scholars try to minimize the command to wives in verse 22 by looking at verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And they conclude that because we now in a new community of Jesus, we ultimately submit to one another. Hence, in Jesus' community, there is no hierarchy or authority. Now, this is a tempting interpretation, but this then makes the following section from verses 22 uh, and the command to husbands, wives, fathers, children, slaves and masters confusing. Because then does this mean that parents in some sense need to submit to their children or that masters somehow to submit to their slaves? No, because when Paul says submit to one another, he means submit to those to have authority over them. I ought to submit to those to whom I ought to submit. And hence, in Paul's culture, he outlines three sets of reciprocal relationships. Relationships where it would be appropriate for one to submit to the other. But also, crucially, as that verse highlights, that this submission is done always out of reverence for Christ. And so the first of these three relationships is two wives. So what does Paul mean there? What does Paul mean by submission? Well, this is a, a tricky concept and passage, and I've benefited enormously from Christopher Ashe's excellent book, Marriage, Sex in the Service of God, a copy which was actually given to Diane myself for our wedding, as a wedding present. Um, and actually, in this book says that submit means order, appointment, or arrangement, and presupposes some superior authority which or who has arranged things or people in some way. And hence, he concludes that at the heart of submission is doing the will of the one to whom they submit. And in the case of a wife, it's submitting to her husband. Why? Well, it's according to this passage, it's because he has some authority over her. Here in Ephesians, we see that Paul is drawing a parallel between the relationship of Christ and the church, the people of God, to husbands and wives. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So in the same way that Christ has authority over the church, the husband has authority over his wife. And hence, this is the rationale that Paul gives for wives to submit to their husbands. Now, submission can be voluntary or involuntary. A despotic ruler, a cruel husband, can force submission to their rule, to their will, where submission is obligated. Um, uh, alternatively, submission can be done voluntarily, as the voluntary submission of the believers of the Spirit to God and to Christ. And we see here that submission that from wives is voluntary. Paul does not tell husbands that they can demand their wives submit, contrary to how the, the man Peter in the story I shared before acted. Submission is something that the wives must do themselves. They have agency um, themselves. 
But we also see throughout verse 23 that the wife submits to a benevolent, a kind authority. An authority that has her well-being in mind. Um, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the body, which, is, which he is the saviour. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that a husband saves his wife. But the role of the head, but the role the head plays in relation to the body is one of blessing. The Christ saved his body, he saved his church, he blessed her, so the church follows in submission. Hence, I think that there are parallels. Paul draws here with the husband and the wife. The head exists to serve the body, bless the body, and ultimately serving God's bigger purpose. Wives are commanded to submit because it reflects the pattern of Christ and his church. Verse 24. Now, as the church submits to Christ, they will say wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And as we've seen throughout Ephesians, the relationship between the church and the Christ is one of unity. Thus, there ought to be unity between a husband and the wife, with wives submitting to the headship of their husbands, ultimately serving the grand purposes of God. And so Christopher Ashe summarizes. He says, we conclude that when Paul tells wives to submit to their husbands, he has in mind a voluntary morally, honourably, and spirit-giving willingness to do the will of the husband rather than insisting on their own will so that together they may serve the will of God. Wives are to submit to their husbands in the same way as the church submits to Christ. Now at this point in the household code of Ephesians in the ancient world, to teach that women should submit to their husbands wouldn't have been overly controversial, for it ref reflected many of the attitudes of the ancient world, or perhaps some of the attitudes even in the 1950s. But at this point in his letter, Paul's original hearers would have then expected him to go on and say something that the husbands, to the husbands, that they were to keep their wives into submission. Aristotle saw the function of men ruling over women as a part of their nature. Socrates maintained that the courage of a man is shown in commanding of a woman in obeying. So what Paul then goes on to say in verse 25 is radical and astonishing. Husbands, love your wives. Love. The word is mentioned multiple times in this section. The man's responsibility is not to rule or command or coerce. It is to love. And this is not an emotional, sentimental, feelings-based love with waterfalls and candles. It's a love that is self-sacrificial self and other-oriented. It turns the focus away from the self and onto the other. It's a love that seeks the other person's good. Husbands, love your wives. I wonder if there were tears from the women who first heard this. Rather than being treated as an inferior object to be ruled, commanded and bullied, here is genuine tenderness, care, protection, service. And the nature of love is expanded in the next verses. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved his church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to prevent present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. A husband is to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? He loved his church by giving up his life for it. He sacrificed his life. He gave everything for it. The love of a husband for his wife is modelled on the self-sacrificial love of Christ. And this love is for her good. Notice that it's to make her pure. Through his efforts, his strivings, he is to make her look good. For her to become perfect, sinless, spotless, without stain or wrinkle. Now this is not an encouragement to buy face lotions or to creams or anything like that. It's not that sort of wrinkles, but an encouragement for her to become morally, spiritually pure and perfect. It's hard to overstate how, just how radical and countercultural this is. Everything the husband does, modelled on Christ, he does for her, even to the point of death. 
giving himself up for her. Which means, I think, one implication is very clear, that any form of domestic violence, abuse or neglect is utterly and completely incompatible with what the Bible is teaching here. Men are allowed to strike their wives in the Quran, but absolutely not in the Christian scriptures. The only physical blows a Christian husband is involved with is the ones he takes on behalf to protect, to serve his wife. That so-called Christian man, Peter, who considered his wife insubordinate and shouted at her, was not speaking any Christian truth. He was not giving himself, emptying himself for his wife to make her pure. He needed to look at his own life and consider how he was going to love his wife, how he was going to give himself up for her, for her benefit, for her holiness, so that she could be pure. Take responsibility for her welfare and well-being rather than just using her. Christ died for his bride. He never abused her. I don't know how I can state this any stronger. Domestic violence or any form of abuse or manipulation or control is completely the opposite of what the Bible is teaching here. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I know of one man who uh, had a young family and he made conscious choices to stay into the office until late until the kids were showered and the dinner was ready so that he could just avoid the difficult and busy time of day with young children. And the excuse that he used was work. No, husbands love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And unfortunately, I think that the Good Wife Guide written in the 1950s gets gender roles the wrong way around. The wife seems to be there to serve the husband, to serve his comfort, his rest, his peace. But the biblical husband is exactly the opposite. He, inspired by Jesus, sacrifices himself for the nourishment and benefit of his wife. I'm not sure if a good husband guide was ever written about how he can give up things, sacrifice things himself for the benefit of his wife. But we actually have one here, an ancient code, 115 words here directed to husbands to be like Jesus to sacrifice like Jesus, wash feet like Jesus, give up life just like Jesus. And now at this point, perhaps I should maybe share something of my own experience because I am a husband and this passage was read at our wedding and I do believe it and I do try to follow it and it does shape how I relate to my wife. But I must confess to my shame that there have been times when I have failed Not in a domestic violence way, not at all. No, I've never hit or raised my voice to die. But I have the other priorities. Work, other projects, enjoyment, sport, selfishness, laziness, not being proactive enough, not listening well enough, not considering her welfare, particularly when the children were very young. Get ahead of loving my wife and laying my life down for her. Ahead of me coming home early from work to do dishes, cook dinner, she could so she could read the Bible or rest or with the, you know, read the Bible with a neighbour so she could be nourished spiritually in a difficult season. And one of the motivations that I missed in why I should lay down my life for my wife is explained in the next verse. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. One of the reasons a man is to love his wife is, in some respects, well, you could say selfish. For it says, he who loves his wife loves himself. Because when married, married, a man and a wife are united. They become one. There is a unity. And a man and a woman are united to be one flesh. And so when a husband helps grow and feed uh, his wife, he serves his wife, he actually serves himself. They're one flesh union. This is what I neglected when I thought that I had other things to attend to rather than serving my wife. In the end, I thought these were my projects, my things, but in the end, my project, my life really was my wife. And And in the end, I neglected myself because my wife and I are actually one. 
Husbands are to love their wives sacrificially as Christ loved the church to make them pure. And then Paul closes his instructions for husbands and wives and summarizes his vision for marriage in verses 32 and 33. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. Now the mystery here isn't so much about marriage, but the mystery surrounds the profound relationship between Christ and the church. The profound interconnectedness. A loving head, Christ, laying down his life for his body, the church. A profound love, a profound service, and a profound unity, a cosmic oneness. For this relationship between Christ and his church underlines in Paul's instructions here. But more deeply, it explains and describes the purpose of marriage. This purpose is very different to modern conceptions of marriage. It's not a joke. It's not simply there to serve male interests. It's far deeper and more profound than love is love. For here we see a deep union between a man and a woman. A beautiful picture of complementarity. Unity amidst diversity. Reflecting the unity and diversity of Christ and his bride. Christ and his church. Human marriages are meant to be like a living parable of the love of Christ and his people. For in the marriage relationship is the joining of a man and a woman, a bride and a groom, two different and unique people united in a way which is modelled in Christ and the church and is meant to be a beautiful picture displaying God's love for his people. Wives and husbands are to relate the same way that Christ relates to the church. Christ lays down his life for his church and the church follows that self-sacrificial lead. It is a beautiful picture of true diversity and unity. Willing submission, sacrificial love. And this gives us a pattern, a model for marriage. Hence the purpose of human marriage is to reflect this. And this is the meaning of marriage. As author and theologian Danny Treweek writes, Our Christian marriages are intended to be a profound witness to me, she's a single woman, single people, of the intimate and eternal relationship that we we as a church will share with our Saviour. Do you see what she's saying here? That our marriages, individual marriages, are to reflect of the whole relationship that we as a church will share with the Saviour. The purpose of marriage is to reflect the profound mystery of Christ and the church. Now, a couple of months before Di and I got married, I was home alone and the phone rang. And it was a strange call. It was a company off doing a promotional deal. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever had someone call up for this before, but it was a promotional deal. They're offering me five free ballroom dancing lessons. Now, I'm not sure if I was being set up or what was going on here, but I got free, five free ballroom dancing lessons. Now, I was engaged to die at the time, and I was thinking about who I should take along. Now, after a, thought, a short moment, I thought, maybe I should take my fiancé. Maybe I should take Di. And fortunately, um, she did, because it might have been a bit awkward me taking somebody else. But anyway, we went along and we learned how to do some ballroom dancing. Now, I must confess, I was quite surprised when the dance instructor told us, when we begin, he says, look, this is how you make ballroom dancing work. He said quite clearly, the man leads, the woman follows. If that doesn't happen, the dance doesn't work. I was stunned. In our modern, contemporary, egalitarian, anti-authoritarian world, to hear the instructor effectively say, the man leads, the woman submits, that's how ballroom dancing works. Now, as we learned this, there was a couple of times when Di didn't trust me and tried to lead me, and it just meant our feet just kind of got tangled up. And there were other times when I wasn't really sure what to do, so nothing happened, and we just kind of stood there. But we practiced, and we did do a waltz on our wedding day. And we even got an applause when we did a successful turn. But I feel that ballroom dancing is a wonderful metaphor for what Paul is saying here. The man, the head of his wife, lays down his life for his wife. The man's job is to use his strength to make the woman beautiful. He is to use all at his disposal to bless and mature the woman. And the woman is to submit to that, to follow her husband as together they serve God in harmony and unity, just as Christ and the church.
Let's pray. Father God, we pray that as we encounter these passages which seem difficult to modern ears, give us wisdom. Help us to read this passage and see afresh the wonder and profound mystery of the relationship between Christ and his church. May the marriages of people in this church be honoured by all, but may they reflect this glorious mystery of sacrificial love and willing respect and submission. And may those of us who aren't married, please give us the wisdom to live faithfully to your word and may we be inspired afresh of your great love for us demonstrated in the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.